Hello, everybody. Welcome to the AUA webinar on diversity in urology initiatives and opportunities. And I am so thrilled to have everyone here watching live. And then we'll be also saving this so that you can check back in later. So it's going to be uh, just a quick introduction of our speakers. And then we're going to go on to the more exciting aspects of the presentation. So again, thanks everyone for joining us. I am Marissa Clifton. And I am the director of the urology residency program here at Hopkins. And I also dabble a little bit with safety and quality. And I am uh, having the extreme pleasure of introducing Dr. Adam Weiner. He is my co-moderator for the day. And we are gonna basically, he is currently a resident at Northwestern and he's gonna be pursuing a fellowship in um, oncology in the very near future, which we're very excited about. And we're gonna introduce the rest of our panelists. We have Dr. Sam Washington. Washington, who is uh, currently an assistant professor in the Department of Urology at UCSF. He did do most of his training at UCSF, and he has been instrumental with the program Ureter, which we're going to hear more about in a few minutes. Our next panelist is Dr. Chanel Wilson, and she did her medical school education at Morehouse and then residency at Augusta uh, University, and she also is FPMRS trained, and we get to hear about her program, Urology Unbound. Our uh, additional panelist, uh, student Dr. Jessica Delgado, is currently a medical student at Indiana University School of Medicine, and she is an incoming urology resident at University of Miami and is going to do great things, and she is the co-founder of Latinx in Urology. And our last panelist speaker is um, Dr. Jessica Beanstalk, and she is a professor at Hopkins in Gyne OB. And importantly, she is a past chairman of a chairperson for the ACGME Council of Review Committee chairs. And she's going to discuss with her, us her experience in the virtual visiting elective in equitable healthcare. So I'm very excited to hear from all of our speakers today. And um, before we get too far along the questions, I want to move on to a little bit about what you all can expect to get from the experience today. So after attending this webinar, you're going to be able to understand the benefits of increased diversity in urology and also describe some of the current efforts to promote urology to underrepresented minorities. And this is such an important topic, and I just can't wait to hear all of the words of wisdom from our panelists. So before we go too far into the discussion, a little bit of a plug for the AUA. All medical students that are here today can actually sign up for an AUA membership for free. With this free membership, you could access the medical student curriculum. You can also access the core curriculum that's available to our residents and our faculty. So it's an amazing resource and I would encourage each and every one of you if you're interested at all in urology to pursue this. And you can also get uh, our guidelines and other things. So please make sure to kind of highlight this so that you can continue. Um, and then I also want to say that throughout this conversation, you're going to have the opportunity to log some of your comments. So go over on the comment side, any questions that you may have, please put them down in the chat. Dr. Wiener and myself will be reviewing them and asking our panelists. This is a great opportunity to see all the great things that our panelists are doing and hopefully inspire all of us to continue this important initiative. And just a little bit of a plug also for the Diversity and Inclusion Task Force. Um, the AUA has constructed this. It's going to be a great resource as we kind of develop our initiatives. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing what they have. It's going to be on the AUA website. And um, uh, we're, we're just really excited to have everyone here and available for us. We have about an hour to cover all of this information. We may go a little bit longer. And I encourage everyone to stick around as long as they can, because I think we're going to get some amazing insights, see how these programs were developed, understand why they're successful and hopefully have some guidelines for the future. I just put on the slide a bunch of different organizations that are doing some amazing things with uh, diversity and equity. So a few of the speakers, their programs are highlighted here, but there are so many more that we maybe weren't even able to include. So I think every in institution has the opportunity to make some big differences, and I'm really excited to see what our panelists have to say. So starting out, um, we're going to kind of focus on identifying the issues and then maybe discuss more about creating the movement. So for all of our panelists, we'll be bringing them on up and I can see them joining us.
And thank you all for being here. We really appreciate your time. It's such an exciting um, opportunity that we have. And I just know that you're incredibly busy. So thank you for being here today. So my first question is going to go to um, Dr. Sam Washington. So we know that many benefits to diversity in medicine exist. Can you describe the most significant benefit that you have found for promoting diversity in urology? I think for me personally, I mean, aside from the benefits that are already kind of demonstrated in the literature, both kind of outside urology and other spaces, personal benefit for me is just creating a network of people that have had similar life experiences. And that may not be the same as the group that I was with through medical school, but I've kind of found people with a common interest, common kind of fire about topics um, that I normally would not have been able to interact with. I think COVID the one benefit it kind of helped because we're all now much more connected via multiple Zoom visits um, to discuss these things, but it created a much broader, wider network um, through promoting uh, diversity in urology. And Dr. Wilson, can you maybe dovetail off of Dr. Washington's conversation? Sure. So, you know, numerous studies and reports have been published, um, especially over the last few years, that show that Black and, under, um, and other minority patients have better health outcomes when cared for by racially and ethnically concordant physicians. And we know that Black physicians are more likely to provide care to patients in medically underserved uh, and under-resourced areas. Um, for Black Americans in particular, this is vitally important since our health has consistently lagged behind those that of whites in this country. And so the most significant benefit for promoting and increasing diversity in urology is that it'll lead to a, a decreased health, uh, decreased urologic health disparities. And then student Dr. Delgado, can you give us any insight from your perspective? Sure. I also want to say thank you uh, to the AUA for putting this together. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so personally, from my perspective, you know, growing up as a Latina, I understood sort of how culture influences healthcare beliefs. You know, time and time I witnessed this apprehension towards seeking medical care, both in my community and even within my own family. And this apprehension is something that we commonly see in URM communities. Uh, due to things like cross-cultural communication barriers, medical mistrust, lack of health uh, literacy, and, and lack of access to healthcare in these patients. So for them, it's difficult to make those lasting connections with their healthcare providers um, that Dr. Wilson was describing. And so the data clearly shows that these URM patients are not only more likely to choose minority physicians, but also to be more satisfied with language concordant providers, uh, also to be more engaged with medical decision-making and those uh, with those providers who are racially concordant. So I think uh, for me as a future urologist, my focus is certainly in providing that excellent care that you all provide uh, for my patients by removing these obstacles, thereby reducing these associated health disparities in the URM populations. Um, and I think that diversity is exactly how we break those cultural, linguistic, and health literacy barriers to allow these patients to seek the exceptional care they deserve. Uh, these are just absolutely fantastic answers. And I'd like to start back with um, Dr. Washington. Um, do you think you could just describe to our audience a little bit about your organization, what you've been aiming to achieve and what successes you've had so far? Yeah, so I think with Ureter, I, I think all of it has to boil down to Dr. Mika Zhang, one of our residents. So during a lot of the discussions that have been going on over the last year, it was really the resident class that kind of came together and wanted to do something to support medical students and others that may not have had the same opportunities as other groups, right, in line with a lot of the discussions that were going on. So I think from a faculty standpoint, it was really us stepping up to help them rather than us kind of being at the forefront um, for all of these things. And really it being more about a resident to student, decreasing that power differential and supporting kind of a nurturing environment, sponsorship and mentorship as our responsibility in that sense, not to really be at the front, but how do we nurture these things that we know are gonna be beneficial that you may not get when you're a medical student talking to an attending, right? Um, so I think from that respect, we're looking now kind of at the end of the year feedback that we've gotten from participants, but anecdotally all have kind of loved it. And it's been one of these things where it's the people involved are the people engaged. And that's both on the mentor side and the mentee side. So you end up with 
groups on each end that are actively participating in the process, which makes it even more beneficial for everyone. And so for our medical students that are tuning in, can you tell them how they can get involved with um, your, your initiative? Yeah, so your, uh, there will be an online link um, in which you can sign up. And it's kind of like a uh, less stressful version of the match. So you sign up, um, you'll have mentees like my, myself on the faculty side or residents and fellows on the trainee side um, listed with medical students. Um, and they'll be matched and that just opens up the lines of communication where you can talk about the application process, career planning, everything else. And that kind of dovetails with more faculty focused mentorship that we're also doing at UCSF. Well, I look to a lot of people taking your initiative and maybe um, stealing it a little to make it work at their programs. So, so Dr. Wilson, can you give us a little bit of an overview about your program and Urology Unbound and what you, you've achieved so far? Yes, yeah, sure. So um, I'm Chanel Wilson. I'm the founder and CEO of Urology Unbound, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the recruitment, retention, and promotion of, of Black urologists. And then we also have the pipeline program called the R. Frank Jones Urology Interest Group, which is a mentorship program available to students who represent racial and ethnic groups that are underrepresented in medicine. Um, at the end of 2020, we had uh, over 65 medical students enrolled, and now we have uh, well over 100. And um, of our applicants who went through the match this past year, 31 of 39 of them matched into urology, which was a huge windfall for us, and we're just so proud of them. And Dr. student Dr. Delgado is one of uh, our my mentees and one of our success stories. I'm extremely proud of her and um, the rest of our students. Thanks, Dr. Wilson. I think that is just fantastic. And uh, student Dr. Delgado, can you tell us a little bit about Latinx in urology, please? Absolutely. So Latinx in urology is uh, a burgeoning initiative. It's something that was co-founded um, by myself and my colleague, Cassandra Zyla, who's another fourth year medical student over at UCLA um, around the time of July 2020. And essentially, we wanted to address the growing need for cultural representation and diversity within the urologic workforce. So uh, we both joined Twitter initially, kind of looking for uh, Latinx urologic mentorship. Um, but we saw the value and we saw that the connectedness of social media would provide this really excellent platform um, to establish these mentorship driven support systems and recruit underrepresented uh, minority medical students to the field of urology. So through this platform, we've been able to address barriers to care faced by Latinx urologists who, uh, just to bring to everyone's attention, only currently represent 3.9% of the urologic workforce, despite being a very rapidly growing demographic um, that currently encompasses 18.5% uh, of the US population. So. Uh, our mission is to support the professional and career development of Latinx urologists through uh, scholarship, mentorship, advocacy, and community engagement. And since its genesis, I think we've been successful in garnering a, a pretty good, pretty vast support system from the community through things like our Physician Spotlight series, uh, which helps highlight the unique journeys of different Latinx urologists that we've been fortunate enough to encounter along the way as well as our mentorship initiatives, which we uh, certainly tried to model uh, after Ureter and Urology Unbound and our Frank Jones and all these great organizations. Um, so we've evolved into a nonprofit organization as well. And our aim is just to continue increasing visibility, recruitment efforts, mentorship and community engagement uh, for both current and future Latinx urologists. So please be sure to check us out. Well, I think these are wonderful um, discussion points. And I had a, a comment that I wanted to address before we move to our next question. And uh, we had someone that was very insightful. They say, what advice would you give to discern if a program values diversity, equity, and inclusion, or is if it's just paying brochure points? Um, so I think this is an important question. And maybe um, Dr. Wilson, can you take this one? Sure. So, you know, uh, we, there's not that many programs that have a lot of uh, Black and Latinx faculty. So traditionally, you'd want to say, well, if their program has the faculty that, that demonstrates, that is uh, 
racially and ethnically concordant with yourselves, you can find mentorship there. But other, other initiatives that can be important to that demonstrate their commitment to diversity is if they offer diversity um, sub-internships that I know we'll hear about later on. Um, if you speak, reach out to their residents and find out the different things that they're doing within their community to reach out to the diverse population there. And um, also reaching out to medical students who are at that program and finding out the level of engagement that they are, they've been able to um, you know, have with the different faculty members. And those are some different ways to figure out whether you know, a program is really serious about increasing diversity. And then uh, Dr. Washington, do you mind answering as well before we move on to our next question? Yeah, I think if you were to look at institutions, I think one of the things you can discern from an institutional level is whether or not they're putting funding behind these things. Because I think at each institution, each program, you're gonna find people who are dedicated to this, um, but it's really differentiating the people that are dedicated and doing this on their own time versus those where the department and institution supports them in terms of infrastructure, funding, resources, and the like, right? So I think, for example, Yurder was, it was a strong support from our leadership to give the funding and uh, support in the back end to help with the infrastructure to get everything up and running, which was great. Okay, so moving on to our next question, and I would encourage the audience to continue to um, put in some questions that they have for our panelists. So how does urology compare to other specialties in terms of your experience of underrepresented minorities among trainees and attendings? So um, student Dr. Delgado, if you could take this question. Sure. Um, so for me, I think uh, just looking at a lot of research and these kinds of things was important. Uh, especially during the recent application cycle, just wanting to examine these trends. And um, the current trends actually show that URM representation and urology trainees uh, lags behind other fields. So there's a significantly lower proportion of URM residents in urology when you compare to other surgical subspecialties and medical fields. Um, additionally, there's a lack of URM representation in academic leadership roles. So the URMs constitute a disproportionately smaller percentage of urologists holding leadership roles like department chairs or, or program directors. So for me, learning that these Latinx urologists just comprise a very marginal portion of urology uh, trainees and attendings kind of leaves an indelible imprint in my mind. Um, in, in reading the 2019 AUA census data that I mentioned earlier, uh, with, with Latinx urologists representing only 3.9 of the urologic 3.9% of the urologic workforce, um, it, it just shows that these statistics, these statistics really pose a certain question, you know, how can we better represent our URM communities um, and address these barriers to care? So, you know, to sum it up, I think diversity is going to be integral to this, to the improvement of URM representation in both urologic pipeline and workforce. And then um, Dr. Wilson, you've had so many mentees that you've had through your um, Urology Unbound experience. What have you noticed kind of as trends when you see these, um, these applicants come through? So looking at our applicant pool, I feel like the, the same amount of students that have been interest, uh, interested in urology are, it's kind of steady due to the lack of representation at programs that don't have home urology programs. And so you tend to get just those students who have early exposure, early access. You know, coming from Morehouse, uh, where I went to medical school, I didn't have a home urology program. And so I was actually one of the first two students to ever match into urology. And we both got interested around the same time, um, well, without a lot of uh, guidance for going into it. And so just when we circle back to looking at how urology um, compares to to sort the other specialties when it looks to when we look at URM representation, that's one of the important um, issues is that we we have a dearth of of minority mentors and academic faculty that are there to to support and promote and sponsor students who are interested in urology, and so. You know, we're looking to increase the exposure throughout through the R. Frank Jones Urology Interest Group, through programs like Ureter and Latinx Euro, so that we can get people connected with faculty who will be able to help them along their journey. 
And I think it's a call for all of us program directors out there to make sure that we do our best in terms of working with students that may not have home urology programs, which I'm excited to hear Dr. Beanstalk's talk to see how we can do that in the future. So moving on to the next question, I just want to thank again everyone that has um, already participated. But 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 we really have some great questions and they're kind of coming through the chat and I'm just so excited to kind of reach it at the end. But um, I wanted to know from the group, what are the impressions of medical students who are URMs regarding urology as a specialty? I think that there are probably a lot of opinions that maybe program directors don't hear, but maybe mentors do. Um, so Dr. Washington, do you mind commenting? Yeah, I think uh, it largely depends on the things that we've discussed already. I guess um, concerns really kind of um, cluster around the perception of uh, ability when it's actually just opportunity, right? So a lot of times people are looking for mentors and people to tell them kind of the ins and outs of urology that you know other groups may not have the benefit of having strong mentors. So I think urology as a subspecialty in general. I think we speak very highly of urology as a field of happy surgeons, right? But through the lens of being a URM, you realize that it's happy surgeons, but you may be part of the, you know, 2%. In this case, it's not that great being part of the 2%, right? So it's really just how can you find within a happy field, um, people that are going to support you, mentor you, and kind of tell you some of the unspoken things to uh, guide you to success. Right. So I think all the medical students I've spoken to about have really been asking questions. What makes urology great for me specifically? Right. And I think that question is very personal. And the answer is very personal, but it's kind of hard to um, answer that without any kind of uh, shared life experience in some ways. And so just to pry a little bit for our uh, URMs that are here, what would you how would you answer that personally? Why did you go into urology? Well, I think for me, and I guess a lot of the other, I'll call them survivors that have uh, made it through the whole process. Uh, I think at the end of the day, it was strong support and mentorship. So like for me, my mentors throughout the whole process from medical school, residency, obviously uh, it worked because they kept me around for some time. Um, but it was a strong mentorship. And that really, in my case, I was lucky because it, I had uh, racially discordant mentors, but there were still strong sponsors and mentors throughout the process. But that meant them going above and beyond through different aspects um, because I didn't have you know, family in medicine or friends that already knew about urology. So I was really coming in green. So it took that extra step to introduce me to kind of some of the nuances of urology that I would not have known otherwise. And student Dr. Delgado, can you tell us a little bit about what your colleagues are saying as it relates to urology and URMs? Sure. So I think uh, very similar to what Dr. Washington was mentioning, I think um, early exposure and mentorship are, are certainly key. Uh, you know, like many of my Latinx colleagues, I was exposed to the field of urology kind of late in my medical school journey. So you know, while my first impressions were, were definitely excellent and, and significantly impacted my future career choice, um, I think that I wasn't alone in feeling that maybe these aspirations were unattainable uh, because of the late exposure. So uh, I think many of my classmates, many other URM medical students uh, do, con do harbor a considerable interest in urology, but the data shows that they often learn about the specialty a little late and then struggle with strengthening their residency applications if they even decide to apply at all. So students definitely recognize that the urology residency match is, is certainly a competitive one and one at which they have to work hard at to shine amongst all the other highly qualified applicants. Um, and for some students, this might entail embarking on some kind of uh, research year, dedicated research year that may or may not be feasible with their current financial standing. Uh, so that just proves to be another obstacle for them. And I think additionally, I can speak for many URM med students in recognizing the importance of the mentor-mentee relationship, uh, as was mentioned. So students like myself who have had the opportunity have been fortunate enough to connect with some really great mentors um, can tell you that, that really just having a physician or resident mentor who can guide you through some of these important decisions significantly impacts medical student impressions as well as uh, is critical and essential just for future success. 
So increasing the visibility of URM urologists, expanding mentorship opportunities and exposure to the field early on, I think is, is critical for students. I think that's so insightful. And then I, I think what you were alluding to as well is a little bit about sponsorship, not even just mentorship, but how do we sponsor people to be successful? And so as we move on to the next question, I think I challenge most of the people in the audience to kind of think about how they can sponsor URM in urology. Um, I have a great question as we're going on to the next question, but um, from our audience, um, what can newly matched URM students do as individuals, especially those that are the first at their respective institutions to continue the momentum surrounding diversity, equity, and inclusion in urology? And so Dr. Wilson, do you mind taking on that question from the audience about how someone that's just joining on can continue that momentum? Love to. So, you know, when you first get into your program, I suggest getting really involved and getting to know your attendings, having them get to know you as a person, fostering relationships so that they can, they can see the value of you being there and, um, and understand that more people who are like you are needed. Also speaking out for your patients, uh, being sure to give them context, uh, the attendings that you work with context that they may not be aware of would be a really important way of show, demonstrating your, you know, the value of, of your presence there. And then you can get involved with um, a lot of these programs, Latinx Euro, uh, Urology Unbound, R. Frank Jones. We've got residents to student mentorship programs so that you can continue to give back to, to the students who are coming behind you and be able to, in some ways, sponsor students yourself to come to your program and be able to speak up for them because you know, residents are actually very involved with uh, the residency selection pro process. A lot of times it might be more vetoing power, but you can always speak up for a student and, and become a sponsor early on in your career. And then uh, student Dr. Delgado, do you have any other thoughts related to this, how we can continue our momentum as we go on uh, in residency? Yeah, I think uh, for me, community engagement is something that's so important. I think giving back to your community and, and being able to reach out and provide resources for uh, the URM population is, is super important. Um, and so, you know, initiatives that can increase educational materials and are available in, in different languages to allow patients to understand those kinds of things are really helpful. I also think that just doing health disparities research is, is also something that's going to further the field of urology in terms of diversity. Um, being acquainted with some of these trends and, and knowing how to identify and address them correctly, uh, I think will get us far in the future as well. And I'm going to save the last question that I received until the end. I'm going to introduce Dr. Adam Weiner to kind of take over and have the next uh, segment of the section, um, hopefully discussing with all the participants how we were successful creating a movement and how we can continue to do so. Exactly. And, and that's exactly how I would introduce this portion of the panel. We've talked about identifying the issues, we've characterized them, we've Add, each of the panelists have had the opportunity to add their personal inputs on, on how, uh, on this important topic. And so now I think we wanna to move towards creating a movement. And, and, and in this portion, we wanna talk about how do we give legs to the things we just talked about? How do we go from identifying the issue to actually, actually doing something about it? And so for the first question, after recognizing an issue, how did your initiative begin? And I wanna start with uh, Dr. Washington. So oh, I guess uh, in the very beginning, it was actually a department-wide discussion. So everything was going on, everyone's activated, everyone was tweeting, you know, all the tweets of everything. Um, but we had to sit down kind of as a department and figure out what we wanted to do, right? And I think at that point, we started to see that the residents themselves were really picking up the torches and like taking things home of how to do it. And then it became a question just on the faculty side how do we support that, right? So we're the ones that can make the time for the residents, that can provide the funds for the residents, provide the infrastructure and the guidance that they need to kind of get these programs going. So Ureter became this thing that the department supported, but was really led by the residents, which is what we want. But from that became other programs that are currently in the works. I won't 
dive into that too much, but that will dovetail with those things. So it creates kind of a pipeline because Uriter, any of these programs by themselves will not fix all the problems, right? But it becomes a network of things that can provide resources, mentorship, sponsorship to people throughout the whole process, right? So I think just realizing we didn't have to reinvent every wheel um, and just focus on one aspect and then work on partnerships from then forward was uh, important. I, I, I like the way that you put that, that you you're, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You're, you're looking for your help and, and collaboration. I think that's an excellent point. And I wanna also give Dr. Wilson a moment to, to reflect on this question too. So if you had to think about how your initiative began, what, what were some of those steps that you took? Sure. So, you know, I started Urology Unbound during my fellowship training. Um, kind of once I realized that I was about to enter a workforce and I hadn't really had much consistent mentorship from black urologists who could give me career advice that was tailored specifically to me, um, who, who I could call on with questions and be able to be vulnerable with them and not feel the need to be perfect all the time. And at the same time, my brother who just matched into urology was uh, started to call me with questions that his colleagues who were also applying um, had about you know, the income, the upcoming virtual sub-internships, the uh, interviews, and, you know, there was a lot of, um, of nervousness around the entire process, especially as a URMs. So, you know, when they realized that his sister was a urologist, I started getting a lot of questions. And I recognized that there was a need for us to come together as a, a community of Black and, and Latinx URM urologists to support this next generation of, of urologists. And really the, the rest is kind of history. It was more, it was a grassroots movement. We would have started with webinars that were hosted by URM and non-URM urologists who all had a, really had a, a, an interest in increasing diversity in our field. Um, so that's kind of how we started. Excellent, and here we are doing a, a webinar on diversity and, and, and your participation is, is really valued here. Uh, as student Dr. Delgado, I, I want you to help me reflect on a, a question from the the audience actually that's related to this topic. The question is, how can we as incoming interns garner support from our leadership to grow projects centered around diversity? So uh, extremely relevant to what we're talking about. Yeah, I think uh, it's important to give back. So um, all these initiatives are helpful to medical students like myself, uh, individuals that are interested in joining the field of urology but don't know really much about it, or maybe they don't see um, urologists that look like them or sound like them or think like them. So it's important to provide that kind of support and, um, like I said, to give back. So as, as an incoming intern and just as you grow through residency, I think it's important to reach out to medical students and, and lend a hand to let them know, hey, you're not alone here, you're supported. Um, let me know how I can provide any kind of mentorship, if I can look over your application, if I can help you out and, and help you pick a program that's probably best suited for you. Um, and overall, just see if urology is the best possible place for you to be. Uh, I, I think that's the best way because the mentorship that I've received has really helped me get this far. Um, I'm very thankful for, for all those individuals who helped me out along the way. So I certainly want to give back. I, I think that's great advice for incoming interns coming from a, a very successful pre-intern who started uh, wonderful projects. I think we'll go to the next question. So here uh, we're talking about resources and, and uh, related to your initiative. So what resources have you found to expand your initiatives and what opportunities have you found that exist for programs aiming to expand their URM programs? So not only what resources you had, but what you would what you would recommend for programs who want to expand uh, their own program. So uh, Dr. Wilson, do you think you can start us off with this one? Sure. So, you know, apart from social media promotion and word of mouth, um, my best opportunities for Urology Unbound's initiatives have been being invited to a variety of uh, speaking opportunities like this one, so that I, I've been able to spread the word and get more students involved. Um, from my financial standpoint, I, I admit I've paid for most things out of pocket, but recently through these speaking engagements, I've, I've had interested parties who've reached out to give me guidance on how to garner sponsorship and apply for grants uh, to help my organization to grow in the coming years. 
And then as it relates to programs that are trying to in, um, aiming to expand their URM programs. I mean, to Dr. Washington's point, putting money and support behind these initiatives, starting um, diversity sub internships, and really financially supporting these students if you want them to come, you know, that's, that's how you will get them. And so that's what programs can do. Hey, I, I'm starting to see a theme here, and, and I, I think you're right. It's kind of a put your money where, the, where your mouth is. And I, I like that point. Uh, student Dr. Delgado, do you have any, any comments on this question? Absolutely. Uh, some of those speaking engagements Dr. Wilson was mentioning, uh, I was lucky enough to help participate in with my colleague, Cassandra. Um, to, to add to what she was saying, I think definitely social media has been a really amazing platform to help expand reaches of our initiatives, include uh, improved student recruitment and retention, um, as well as sponsor mentorship, like she mentioned. Uh, Twitter specifically has helped us with those things. But Latinx and Urology has also recently presented at LMSA National Conference alongside Urology Unbound, uh, our Frank Jones interest group as well. And we found it to be a really great way to network and connect with interested students. So I think programs aiming to expand URM participation should certainly look into conferences like LMSA, SNMA, uh, and different speaking engagements. Um, I think programs should also connect students with mentorship opportunities, like many of the ones mentioned here today. And additionally, uh, you know, the funding is always important. Uh, some URM students, um, may not be in a financially stable situation and maybe don't have the opportunity to participate in sub IRA way rotation. So these kinds of stipend funds and diversity scholarships are always helpful uh, to sort of enhance the learning opportunities for these students. I think I just wanted to add also kind of a plug for within your own institution, there are going to be a lot of people both within your same discipline and outside that are ha also interested. So for us specifically, there are similar programs that have scholarships to allow students to come over. So what we did was kind of co-op their infrastructure for a program that'll roll out once we can have people in person. Um, but it'll be a combination of guided mentorship, career development, application, mentorship, but also a sub-I specific to URM students with a stipend. So financial barriers for just cost of living and paying for groceries while you're here with us shouldn't be a problem, right? It shouldn't be a barrier to you getting help. But then also combining that with other, uh, you know, colleagues in other disciplines for more a program or institutional wide effort. And then how can urology be one aspect to bring medical students interested in oncology broadly to get some exposure to urology, but also medical oncology, also radiation oncology. So how can you fit into a larger puzzle within your own institution as well? That doesn't require your chair doing the bulk of the lifting or you know, covering all the receipts. I, I love both those points because I think it, it reminds us that urology doesn't exist in a vacuum. We have other, other groups and other uh, medically inclined groups that are, that are interested in the same goals that, that I think we're all talking about here. Uh, let's head to the next question. And that question is, uh, what is being done to promote uh, URM representation in urology? Uh, Dr. Wilson, do you want to start us with this one? Sure. So uh, student Dr. Delgado mentioned the physician spotlights that they're doing over at Latinx Euro. Um, we were also doing something similar um, at uh, the Arthur Frank Jones Urology Interest Group. And so there've also been presentations at most of the programs the conferences that I've gone to this year that have specifically addressed the, the lack of diversity in urology and what we can do to in, increase it. And so it's evidence that the leaders in our field recognize the need to diversify our workforce. And really I'm hopeful that that momentum continues um, for years to come. Uh, additionally, there's some really important work being done out of UCLA by Dr. Chantal Ghani. Uh, she's, she's got an amazing survey that's coming out and she's gonna be looking at longitudinal um, experiences of URMs who are applying to the field. And so work like that is just vitally important to increase in diversity. Excellent, excellent. Thank you for pointing that out to us. That's wonderful. Uh, Dr. Washington, do you, do you have anything you'd like to add to this point? Well, I think uh, what we've also seen is what people have touched on before, the echo chamber that is social media has become ever important in kind of getting the word out. You know, a year or two ago, it would really just be emails sent out that 
would get lost in spam filters, right? But really now, um, Twitter has kind of opened that up for us to promote across kind of institutional lines and reach groups that we may not have before. But I think the main thing now is that it's all intentional in terms of promoting URM representation. It's not kind of by chance or just one group. It's kind of a concerted effort response to a legitimate need within our field and medicine as a whole um, to improve URM representation. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I like what both of you are getting at. There seems to be, it's just a note of positivity that we're all talking about this more and that there seems to be a, a lot of interest in promoting all of the ideas that we're, that we're all speaking about here. I, I think we'll head to the next question. And for this question, what can medical schools do to promote URM uh, in, in their classes? And I want to start with student Dr. Delgado, as you are the only one on this call currently in medical school. Uh, what's your opinion on this point? Yeah, so I think that definitely all the things we talked about, I, I will mention again, but certainly funding is important. Um, as a URM myself, I find the concept of community be, to be something that's fundamental. And so I think it's important for these medical schools to uh, promote urology interest groups. Um, these are you know, networking opportunities for aspiring urologists. It kind of helps create a support system. You have your peers, and then you can also help facilitate mentorship connections. Uh, something that I think if it's one thing students can take away from this webinar, it's that mentorship is, is really, really helpful, you know? Um, additionally, I think programs should provide more information sessions and webinars that expose students to current diversity initiatives like the one uh, we're currently on right now, especially this past year, seeing how uh, virtually we can reach a lot more students, a lot more programs, uh, and doing those kinds of things, as well as providing intersectionality and sensitivity training as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And and I think uh, to your point, the, the fact that we're having this webinar, I'm hoping is showing people who are watching in medical school, medical students on the call that this is something the AUA is extremely, uh, is taking very seriously and values. And uh, Dr. Washington, did you, did you have anything you wanted to add to this? I would say at the end of the day, the main thing that they can do to promote URMs in their classes are for medical schools to accept URMs in their classes, for residency programs to match URMs in their classes, right? Everything else other than that is simply a tweet or a brochure or anything else, right? At the end of the day, if we want to get more urologists in that are URMs, then we have to get more residents that are URMs. We have to get more medical students that are URMs. So it's not, again, urology is not in a vacuum and these students don't just kind of come out of nowhere. Um, they have to get into medical school and they have to get exposed to urology early and then they have to match into urology. Absolutely, absolutely well put. And I, I, want, I do wanna to move to the next question. And, uh, to this, and for this one, I, I, I think it's a very important one. We, we started getting at it earlier, but as a URM advocate, which I, I think all of you have certainly demonstrated that and, and, and the main reason why you're on this panel today, uh, what attracted you to the field of urology? And I wanna start with uh, student Dr. Delgado, just because uh, you, you are the most recent to de decide you were gonna enter urology and what, what brought you to, to our wonderful field. <laughs> so uh, for me, as a, a URM medical student and advocate, I think uh, certainly I was, like everyone else, I was attracted to the field of urology by the amazing individuals, both physicians and patients. Um, and then, of course, I had this kind of lifelong interest in health disparities with regard to the effect of race and ethnicity uh, on risk stratification. And uh, for me, it became interesting to see how this worked in certain urologic conditions. Um, I grew up as a second generation Cuban American in Miami, and I definitely saw, like I mentioned earlier, how apprehensive uh, certain cultures can be about accessing medical care, seeking medical care, and those kinds of things. So seeing family members who uh, refuse to get screening, refuse to uh, know about these preventative strategies, uh, certainly affected me in that way. And then when it was urologic in origin, I was just more interested. And so uh, wanting to explore that a little bit further is what uh, sparked my interest. And then uh, late in my third year, I was able to um, participate in a urology elective. And I think everything else just fell into place and I loved it. I love it. I love it. I, it it's kind of allowing me to relive my own uh, 
uh, first encounters with urology. So thank you for that. Uh, uh, Dr. Wilson, did, did you have a comment on this? Yeah. So, you know, urologists have the opportunity to discuss and educate patients on conditions related to their sexual health, uh, avoiding dysfunction and other uh, topics that are often considered taboo. Um, as an Afro-Latina, I was very aware of the myths and a lot of the incorrect information regarding these topics that were prevalent in my community. So I wanted to be the person who was having these conversations with, with my community so that I could, I could dispel these myths and help patients to feel comfortable with their bodies and to prioritize their qualities of life. And so that's kind of what drew me to the field. I, I love that point because it goes directly back to your earlier point about why it's important to have more diversity in our field because you you are that, you can be that voice in that community. So I think that's wonderful that you, you put it that way. Uh, Dr. Washington, did you have any, any final points on this? I think kind of on the oncology side, uh, from a, I guess a nerdy standpoint, it was always interesting to me. And uh, I think one of the draws as a medical student was just the field overall and the personalities within. But I think when you start to see specifically within oncology and prostate cancer and other cancers, the dramatic and persistent disparities that continue to exist, you start to see, okay, how can I change, you know, the narrative, change the way that we think about these things to remove some of the stigma, to remove some of the burden from the patient and take it on as the urologist, as a person within the healthcare system to see how change can happen, right? So I'm not saying I'm going to fix everything, but at least I can be part of that progress. Well, wonderful. I, I, I love each of your points. This was our final uh, standard question. So we're actually going to move on to the next portion of our panel of our uh, webinar. So we're going to bring uh, Dr. Clifton back. There we go. I just want to say how much I've enjoyed kind of being in the background, listening to this conversation. I think it's so incredible. So I, I've seen the chat kind of go crazy. So we have some really good questions at the end. But right now, I wanted to take a quick sec uh, second to introduce Dr. Jessica Beanstalk, who is one of my personal mentors within MedEd. And I'm just so glad that she can be here. Um, I'm very excited about this initiative and hearing about this initiative. So unlike a lot of things in, in medicine, she has some data to kind of support why this is a great opportunity. So she's going to be discussing her experience at the virtual visiting elective in equitable healthcare. And hopefully some of the people on the call can hear about how this is a great initiative and maybe different institutions can try to utilize it to, as Dr. Washington alluded to, increase the pipeline, the flow into um, urology in terms of diversity. So Dr. Beanstalk, thank you for being here today. Thank you so much, Dr. Clifton, and thank you to the AUA for this kind invitation. Um, I want to share with you the Johns Hopkins journey towards trying to build more diverse residency programs. It, I, I've been the DIO for four years now, which means I'm in charge of all of our 103 residency and fellowship programs at Hopkins. And I want to show you where we started and tell you a little bit about how we're how we're making progress. So, um, Christina, can I have the next slide? So, this is uh, the brutal truth of what diversity at Johns Hopkins looks like. Um, you can see on the left-hand set of columns what our medical student class looks like in terms of diversity, moving from 2016 in the red to 2020 in the blue. You can see what our PhD programs look like in the set of columns in the middle. And unfortunately, you can also see what the residency programs look like. So while my peers, my fellow associate deans for um, undergraduate medical education and for graduate biomedical education, we're making great progress. Our residency and residency programs were not making similar progress. So I took this problem to our graduate medical education committee of which Dr. Clifton sits on it. It's all the residency pro program directors in the institution. And we had a long, hard look at ourselves to say, okay, what can we do to change this? Because this is something that we truly believe that diversity brings strength to an institution. Um, and so we, we've been working to try to improve it. And I'll show you some better numbers at the end. So could I have the next slide, please? 
So we did this in a multimodal way. First, I thought, okay, well, maybe just giving people data, they'll see the problem and they'll they'll fix it. They'll recruit more diverse students into to become residents. And so we did that first. Um, did that, looked at our data again, not much of a budge. 2018, we said, okay, we're gonna use our plan, do study, act cycle. And we shared more data, shared it publicly, figured, well, maybe publicly embarrassing people might help. Nope, didn't make a big make di make a big difference. We invited the assistant dean for um, student admissions because they had done a, such a great job at in getting a more diverse medical students. Tried to do that, figure out, educa educate people. Maybe we'd make a change. Um, and, and we even founded a house staff diversity council. And there was a question earlier on as incoming residents, what can you do at your institution? If your institution does not have a house staff diversity council, go meet with your, your associate dean for graduate medical education or your DIO offer to help, help change that and found a house staff diversity council. It's one of the proudest things that I have ever done. And my role as a DIO over the last four years is work with my residents to, to, to found a house staff diversity council. Um, we published a paper in the Journal of Graduate Medical Education um, last month showing you step by step how you can do it if you want to. So anyway, so we're still not making any progress. So 2019, we had a little bit of progress. Um, we started, we gave implicit bias workshops for our program directors, we did a separate diversity recruiting weekend where we paid for 50 the students from underrepresented groups to come back to Hopkins um, to have um, another look at us and see if are they we're trying to tell them what all the exciting things we had going on. Um, we waived the fees to do electives. So a little bit of a bump, not as much as we'd like. And then finally the pandemic hit. And this is going to be one of the few good things that come out of the pandemic, and that's that we really found that we could use this opportunity to um, offer a virtual visiting elective in equitable healthcare as a way to reach out to people of color to say, hey, come look at Hopkins, um, interact with our faculty, interact with our students, and see what you think. So we did that. We also did a workshop on how to interrupt bias um, in the recruiting process for all the all of our um, program directors. It was mandatory. Um, and we held a couple of webinars on um, recruiting for diversity. So I'm going to talk specifically for the next few minutes about our virtual visiting elective. Can I have the next next slide, please? So pandemic hit all the all the um, visiting electives got shut down. This had been in the past a way for us to attract students to Hopkins to become residents, but all of a sudden we couldn't. The dean said to me and the department directors said to me, Jessica, fix it. Couldn't fix the pandemic, but I couldn't figure out a way to make a virtual elective. I luckily partnered with some fabulous fourth year medical students who were something called the Osler Apprentices, and they were doing, um, they had special interest in creating curricula and becoming educators and working with them starting in early May, we put together a curriculum, we recruited faculty leads. We, um, I personally learned to use Twitter specifically so that we could tweet out and use Instagram so that we could advertise for this elective. And we put on the elective for two weeks from the end of September to the beginning of October. I'm going to tell you more about that elective in a minute. Can I have the next slide, please? So these are the course faculty. The four, first four um, little pictures you see on top are actually all medical students. It was all also led by me as the Dean for Graduate Medical Education, my um, equivalent Dean um, in undergraduate medical education, and then some of then our um, Vice President for Diversity, as well as our senior associate dean for diversity. And then you can see on the right, all the different, we had 11 different medical specialties participate with many, many faculty members helping move those, those curricula forward. Can I have the next slide, please? So our, we had um, a universal curriculum and we had a specialty specific curriculum. In the purple was the time in the mornings we gave time for the specialties to have specialty specific curricula. And I'll give you an example of one, one department specialty specific curriculum in, in a minute. But then um, in the afternoons, we had shared universal curriculum. Um, 
primarily focusing on equitable healthcare, but also making sure that we provided professional development, um, networking opportunities, talked about leadership, talked about how to be an effective um, leader in your field. We did um, CV development, you know, a wide variety of, pers of um, personal development um, and for our, our visiting students. Um, and then we had some time for them to socialize with our residents as well. May I have the next slide, please? So this is an example from the neurology curriculum. You can see this is the two weeks actually on the first on the top and the bottom are the first and the second week. And you can see that they did a wide variety of things with their time in neurology. Um, they had the medical students go to case conferences. They had them go to telehealth clinics. They did all sorts of exciting things with that time. May I have the next slide? But every specialty got to decide for themselves what they wanted to do with the time. You can see most of the specialties um, chose to do meet and greet with residents. They chose to have the medical students participate in the existing conferences and in some asynchronous activities and as well as some lectures and small groups. But some specialties also figured out how to get their medical students in, into virtual inpatient clinics or virtual outpatient clinics and into the virtual inpatient settings as well as into virtual ORs. So really exciting and lots of opportunities for creativity. And remember, we put this together fast because all of a sudden um, we had to we had to pivot. So now that we know much more and all that we've learned, um, we have some exciting ideas about how to move forward. May I have the next slide, please? Um, so when we looked at the demographics, we specifically recruited when we were tweeting um, out to get people excited about this and get people to sign up. We were specifically recruiting for diversity, although not everybody we attracted was um, were from diverse backgrounds. And in fact, we had people submit essays about why they wanted to participate so that we could make sure that the folks who were from majority populations were, had significant commitment to improving um, equi equitable healthcare. Um, so, um, oh, my boxes came out funny here, but 64% of our students um, were um, from diverse, self-identified as being from diverse backgrounds. Um, and again, sorry for where the red boxes came out, but 45% of them found out from, about it from social media. May I have the next slide? When we asked students after the course what they thought of the course, um, they found that the course did a really nice job at exposing them to Hopkins and giving them opportunities for mentorship and to network. Um, may I have the next slide? Can I have the next slide? Um, oh, one, one back, please. Thanks. What we weren't planning for, but that came, evolved very organically because I think because the medical students were leading this, Initially, um, there was we organically ended up putting in lots of opportunities for um, professional development. And I would say for any of you who are thinking about doing something like this, really use this as an opportunity to provide some mentoring um, and some um, real focus skills about how to how to make sure that the students you're attracting go on to successful careers. May I have the next slide, please? So I told you that we were sort of embarrassed about how we were doing with the diversity of our programs, although we were doing a little better than national numbers would would suggest. However, can you hit the next slide? Hopefully it'll populate. There you go. Um, I'm happy to, to report that we've seen some um, real impact of our work. And again, it's not it wasn't only the virtual visiting elective. We were doing lots of other things, too. But um, this year, 21% of our incoming first year class um, will be from underrepresented backgrounds. And this is an extraordinary accomplishment for us after being stuck in one place for a long time. So I'm very excited about that. Um, can I have the last slide, please? I just wanted to, um, you've heard a lot earlier today, a lot of my colleagues spoke about the importance of social media. Um, social media is what helped drive our success. We um, created, I, I quickly learned how to how to um, use Instagram and use Twitter to advertise. And we did that, you can see on the left. And then we're also part of what we're doing is we're building the next generation of physicians. This was a session we had this past Saturday. Um, we had our second annual one day medical school for area 
um, high school students and a few of our own Hopkins med um, undergrads snuck in too. Um, and we uh, are growing our next generation of physicians and medical students. So with that said, I'll stop. Thank you very much for the invitation. And um, I really appreciate what you all are trying to build in neurology. Take care. Dr. Beanstalk, thank you so much for presenting the data. I, I like this example because it shows how even with a very short amount of time, maybe sort of limited resources, you were able to construct something that actually has a meaningful impact. And it may be a little bit inspiring to the group that is with us today to think even these small changes can actually result in meaningful endpoints. And so we've talked about, like, I, I like to think about Latinx and neurology, a very small group, lot, not a lot of support necessarily. And all of a sudden, it's a social media, I, I would say, kind of phenomenon in the sense that they're retweeting, they're promoting, they're encouraging each other. Um, so I'm going to bring all of our panelists back because we have some really great questions and I want everyone to be included on it. We have some great questions in the chat. I don't want to extend the time too much beyond, uh, beyond nine, but if you all have some specific questions, please feel free to uh, put them in the chat. So kind of with our panelists that are here right now, one of the comments that came up and maybe even Dr. Beanstalk can answer uh, this one. I'll let her start um, start because this is kind of a more of a financial consideration. So uh, basically, how can incoming interns garner support from leadership to basically grow these initiatives? So we know that there's interest. We see that that it's pretty diverse. But how in the world can someone who's starting out as an intern really start to promote these movements? So thanks. That's a really great question. And I would say that the person who has the money in your institution is your associate dean for graduate medical education. And as I... Don't tell Dr. Clifton that. Um, but we, you know, diversity is so important to us as leaders of the institution. And, you know, we're looking across all the programs. And I think, as I said to you earlier, one of the best things that ever happened was that my emergency medicine house staff came to me and said, we want to start a diversity, a house staff diversity council. You know, I was trying to figure out how to improve diversity. And they said, help, let us be part of the solution. And so we've built a really nice, um, robust House Staff Diversity Council. So if you show up at your institution and there is not something like that, you know, SNMA is great, but they primarily focus on medical students. They don't tend to focus on residents much. Try to work with your with your institutional leadership. I, I expect you'll have a, find a really warm welcome. And then I would say, uh, Dr. Washington, can you also, as someone that's kind of inspired, or you basically were listening to, to, to your residents talking and the medical students talking, how can people be successful coming into residency? Uh, oh, just in terms of this or broadly, I guess. Well, <laughs> well, I would say in terms of how do you keep uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion kind of going forward, even when you're like the low man, low woman on the totem pole, how do you keep that initiative uh, going forward? Yeah, I would say the first step would be finding people above you, whether that be senior residents, faculty, fellows who are interested in it. Because I think, you know, we have to take a step back. We are in a very exciting subset of people who are interested in this topic and improving diversity, right? But that is not the consensus across our entire field. So finding people that are supportive and willing to nurture, mentor, sponsor is obviously the first step. And they will get you set up with people who can fund and support from an infrastructure and cost standpoint, and then be the people to talk to the associate deans Right, so you're not the intern cold emailing, you know, someone way up on the ladder. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So I think there's a few steps in there, but finding someone who's supportive is obviously the first thing. The associate dean is very nice. They like to be. They, 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 they should not be intimidated by associate deans. Okay, maybe that was. Just me. <laughs> and and Dr. Weiner, do you have any questions for the audience? Absolutely. We have a question that is is uh, directed towards Dr. Beanstalk. Uh, so first off, they they were they they wished you a, they said that you had an excellent presentation, and they asked, 
are, are there any plans to integrate urology into that program? And if so, how do you plan to do it so that other programs may learn? Yeah, so Dr. Clifton it has already volunteered to be the faculty lead for us for this coming year. So yes, we will be integrating urology. I think what happened, um, they, because of our short timeline and where the urology matches, it didn't work out this year, um, but we already have plans for urology for this year. So yeah, and then quite honestly, we need to publish about this um, because that's the way you reach the broadest number of people. So we're working on that. And I just am gonna kind of, again, dovetail off of what Dr. Beanstalk said, there are a lot of um, faculty political issues that are kind of like time, allotment of time, you know, who's in charge of this. And so we have a separate medical student director compared to the residency program director. But I think as Dr. Washington was saying, you have to find people that are passionate and that are going to support the initiatives. And sometimes we all have to kind of change what our roles are to make sure that we pursue things that are important to the um, uh, diversity of, you know, for me, I always want not only um, diversity in general, but cognitive diversity. I think that brings about, you know, innovation, solutions. It's just life experiences. I, I'm so much more fulfilled in a group like that. So I think sometimes we have to step outside our comfort zone and try to do something a little bit differently, which um, Dr. Beanstalk has basically proved to every single program director at Hopkins that if we don't do this, that we're doing something wrong. Now, that's not always the case where every institution has this kind of incredible support where you can be successful. But I think it's just one example about if, if you're interested in it and you do an initiative and you track your outcomes, you can maybe make an argument for some really productive changes. And so now she's going to stand up at our meetings and say, look at what we did. And if you're not doing that, why aren't you? And why haven't you invested into it? And so I think sometimes we struggle with the end points. But really with this group, we're, we're seeing how much better things can be if we make sure that we pursue it. So that's my soapbox. Um, so I, there were a couple of other great questions. I don't want to spend too much time beyond our, our allotted time, but I think there are some really great questions. So I'm going to ask the panelists, you know, it's interesting because this is a, a, a panel really to focus on medical student experience, opportunities, you know, how to promote diversity. But I have questions in the chat, basically, how do we do this for fellows? So I would like to maybe kind of pick your brains on how do we make this successful beyond just, you know, medical student and residents and, and how do we continue it forward for all of urology? And um, Dr. Wilson, do you mind kind of comment, uh, commenting a little bit about that? Sure. So I think that one of the, the really important things is that we have discussions across the board with leadership in, in these residency programs and the fellowship programs, um, conversations like this that don't just focus on medical school, medical students, but like you said, urologists across the board. A lot of times people are just not aware of the issues. They just, there's blind spots that folks have because of the, I always struggle with this word but with, um, because they're in, a, in an environment in which they're just around the same all the time. And so when you reach out to folks who are diverse in your specialty and you can have these conversations where, where people like me and people like Dr. Washington, a student Dr. Delgado can tell you and let you know about your blind spots so that we can increase the diversity, we can increase the equity and inclusivity in all of our programs that at that point will have a lot of uh, real and lasting change. And Dr. Washington, were you about ready to say something? Um, yeah, I was going to say the next step after this, I mean, it's the same issue through the entire pipeline, right? So as a medical student, it's called representation. As faculty, it's called retention, right? But it's the same issue throughout. So it's not just getting people to graduate, right? But how do you retain this group within the workforce or within academics so they can perpetuate that? So it's really something where every step of the way, as others have mentioned before, you can help those who are earlier in the process, right? To kind of re not only recruit, but retain the representation and maintain it throughout the whole process and our workforce as a whole. And um, Dr. Washington, since you just had the last comment, there was a question from the audience basically asking, we know that US 
MLE scores on average are a little bit lower for URM. Um, and, and they kind of want to know what guidance would you offer in searching for the right program in the setting of less competitive scores? And I know Dr. Beanstalk may have something to say about the change, but when you look at an application as an academic urologist reviewing these applications, what are the things that your team is looking for that can kind of, uh, I, I guess, balance out some of these um, disparities that exist? I think, you know, uh, so current full disclosure, I'm the confidential advisor for our department. So I'm technically rec recused from the actual process. Um, so I can remain a confidential advisor for medical students, right? But our process I know at UCSF is very holistic. And that doesn't mean that people can have any scores and still, you know, match, but people are competitive in a lot of different ways. I think when you look at programs that only rely on scores, you systematically exclude groups, right? And I think it's when our leadership really started to look at things like talented people who happen to be diverse, is the catchphrase he always likes to say, but also looking at grit and resilience. So I feel like those are stronger predictors of performance later than just a test score for me because I did a test prep course, right? Like that doesn't reflect anything after taking the test. It just reflects how I'll do on the next test. So a little bit broader um, review, holistic in some ways, of applications and places that are more interested in that would be things that I would look for. And then Dr. Beanstalk, do you mind kind of talking about what your experience has been as DIO at Hopkins in terms of making sure that we are um, looking at our applicants holistically? Yeah, so I think I mentioned earlier that we did a specific um, seminar for all of our program directors, specifically um, entitled Interrupting Bias in the Recruitment Process, to, to make the points that we're, everyone's making here today that, okay, so you can take a standardized test, does that necessarily make you a good doctor? I don't think so at all. Um, and so we talked about the, the broad range of skills that people bring to the table and the strength that diversity brings to any program. Um, so, and I think as we keep discussing that message, it's, it seems to be sinking in. The other thing that we spoke about earlier on this webinar was the importance of vert, uh, visiting electives and putting some finances behind visiting electives. Many of our, of our departments have chosen to put money behind um, stipends for housing and food. Um, at the central school level, we waived the cost of the registering for the course, for a course if you were a visiting student who was underrepresented. So um, I think just, you know, when you go to a place, they get to know you. I, I, I was a residency program director for 16 years. I can tell you there were many, many residents who I hired because my own residents came to me and said, Jessica, this person did an elective with us and they're fabulous and you have to take them and you're crazy if you don't. It's a good way to get a job, quite honestly, and to welcome um, folks who are underrepresented in medicine to our campus lets us have a close look at them and lets them have a close look at us. So I think all those ideas work. Well, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Weiner. did you have any closing questions for our panelists? I don't see any more that we haven't touched on. I do see a lot of people being just very thankful for, for all of you and, and, and stating that this was an excellent presentation. Well, and, and I would like to give all of our panelists just one or two parting words for the audience, because I think everyone always listens to like the last bit. So um, I'm going to start out with Dr. Wilson. Do you have any parting thoughts for our, our medical students listening on the call? Well, uh, not so much thoughts, but invitation. Uh, if you are interested in urology, I would love to work with you. We would love to mentor you. Uh, if you go over to our Twitter page, the RFJ Urology Interest um, group, we, are, we have the link there to sign up for our mailing list and to register for our group. And then we'll be able to go from there. And we would just love the opportunity to, to mentor you and increase the diversity in our field in that way. 
And I would have to give her props for being an incredible mentor. Um, going on to student Dr. Delgado, any uh, Delgado, any sort of um, final parting words for our audience? Yeah, I think uh, my advice for medical students who might be interested and would be starting the application cycle this year. I think if the past year has taught us anything, it's that we need to take advantage of the opportunities that we have now. Um, so I would say immerse yourself in urology, take advantage of any electives, urology electives you might be interested in, prepare very well for your rotations, um, and use social media to your advantage, network and use it for um, research opportunities as well. Um, additionally, I'd like to add, please reach out. I'm happy to provide any more advice to interested medical students or just to go over CVs, personal statements and things like that. Uh, and lastly, uh, if you're interested in Latinx and urology, please uh, join our list or latinxuro at gmail.com or just reach out to us via Twitter. Dr. Beanstock? So I think the biggest mistake people make is that they think that there's a lot of distance between them as medical students and their faculty or their faculty leaders. Please don't think that way. Um, to me as a full professor and dean at Johns Hopkins, the medical students look like younger versions of me. Um, I want them to succeed. I want them to help them get, get where they wanna go. And they, please don't, don't find your leaders intimidating. We, we, we want you, we want your ideas because you are the next generation. You are the future. We, we um, to quote from Yoda, you are, um, we are what, hold on, we are what they will grow beyond. I think that's the right quote, <laughs> right quote. Basically, we want, you're gonna be better versions of us. So please help us, help us get, let you get there. And then Dr. Washington. I was gonna say, uh, just reach out. The only thing people can say is no or not respond to an email, right? But I think the main takeaway from all of this is that it's not just one person you can reach out to. There's a lot of different things going on locally, nationally, and there's a lot of receptive people that you may not know until you reach out. So just reach out to any of us, all of us, anytime. Well, I just want to thank the panelists. We'll bring up the rest of the slides as we kind of wrap up our session. I just, I really want to say, well, first follow the AUA on Twitter because it's super important as we heard that social media is the future of how we promote all of these things. We can see there are a lot of hashtags that they have list, listed. Um, and I, I really do think there's an amazing online community of support. I've seen people be very successful with their navigation of social media. And I have to say, I didn't, you know, do Twitter until about a year ago either, um, Dr. Beanstalk. So, you know, I, I, I know how that goes. Um, and on to the next slide, I just really want to thank all of our panelists, our amazing panelists that spent their evening with us to give us insights that are so important, going above and beyond. So Dr. Washington Wilson and student Dr. Del uh, Dr. Uh, Delgado, as well as Dr. Beanstalk. I think this is invaluable information and hopefully will make meaningful change. I want to thank Dr. Seth Cohen, who uh, kind of pass the baton on to me and Dr. Weiner, who has just been an amazing support and I've loved partnering with him even though we've never met in person. It's been fantastic getting to know everyone virtually. So if you have questions, please reach out to the group. I think everyone's available and I'm just amazed at how many resources are out there. So let's make sure to continue to utilize them and to innovate and make progress for the future. Um, so thank you all and any other questions you have, please send our way and I hope everyone has a great night. Thank <sighs> you.